Chimir is a distant planet. It is defined by waves of life brought from Earth and set free to evolve independently in this new context. The indigenous life of the planet, swarms of microbes called magic by the people who live there, are what harvest Earth organisms and make copies on Chimir. As the asteroid which concluded the Mesozoic never struck Chimir, dinosaurs remain the dominant terrestrial megafauna. In the folklore of the peoples of the Free States, one of the most beloved figures is a race of tiny oliphants with the intelligence of mankind. They wore clothes, could speak, and wore proficient sailors. These beings, called Chugeuth, or Little Elephant Men in the common tongue, and Korikoim by the residents of the Kenta Islands, are said to have traded with the peoples of the known world during the Age of Witches. But during the wars that transitioned Chimere from the dominion of the witch-ruled states into the Dark Ages, the Elephant Men disappeared to become a distant memory shrouded in myth. Based on studies of Chimere's fossil record, the grasslands had only one consistent lineage of proboscideans, the prairie oliphant. Most proboscideans failed to establish themselves in this open habitat largely due to predatory pressures of living alongside theropods of comparable size. However, Chimere and paleontologists believe that this lineage of gomphotheres survived because of several anatomical and behavioral advantages largely acquired due to prolonged exposure to theropods and evolving alongside them, in an arms race which unfortunately ultimately made their predators more efficient at killing new and unprepared species of elephant. Megaraptorans like the Zentar and Uktan have shown that, while elephant tusks can be formidable weapons, at large size they are fairly reliable to restrain so the theropod can employ their long claws to pierce the throat or between ribs. Prairie oliphants circumvented this by using their lower tusks as an independent weapon, alongside using the tusks only after subduing, after ramming, or trampling. This didn't always work, of course, but appears to have given them a significant advantage over their more derived configuration. Their greatest adaptation, however, was intelligence and social structure. Males became far less combative with one another. Must, a period during which hormones spike their aggression, was muted to facilitate closer proximity and comfort with other bulls. Most Chimerian proboscideans see reduction in the symptoms of must, as this puts them in greater likelihood to charge predators, and when the predators you charge are as large as you, this can have undesired results. But this reduction in symptoms was especially noted in grassland oliphants to make them more comfortable around each other even during the mating season. Males typically remained with their natal herd in the social structure more similar to orcas than modern proboscideans, and though some did strike out on their own. Having bulls around who were related to the females meant more reliable protection, and as adults, these uncles were especially close to and protective of their pregnant relatives and the youngest members of the herd. Herds were generally nomadic, which allowed for these bulls to mate with unrelated females, and they still emit long-distance calls to find potential mates while in must. Like the koga, the base of the male oliphant's trunk can inflate, making for a resonating chamber that can carry their infrasonic calls as far as 16 miles in open prairies, and can be weaponized to a minor degree against the auditory-focused megaraptorans that hunt them. Though a population of prairie oliphants has recently been discovered in northern Kairul, and study of them has allowed for a more comprehensive understanding of their ancestors, this species was presumed extinct beyond this region with the arrival of housey grass, the glanos, and the uktan. A recent study by the Assembly has, however, shown a lineage carries on in perhaps an unexpected place an archipelago north of the known world. In the late 1910s, assembly naturalists conducting a routine survey of a now-classified island chain isolated by unusually deep waters on all sides. There was evidence of boats and settlements, so as is assembly procedure, non-invasive surveys were conducted. 
Although Chimerans were the anticipated inhabitants, or perhaps some sort of Homo erectus, it did not take long to realize these islands were, in fact, populated by miniature proboscideans. A Kenturian consultant was contacted and informed the team that, although to the stories he was told as a boy before his own islands were conquered by the Kadrith, the Kenturim had promised these islanders their location would remain a secret. Out of respect for this old treaty, the consultant was called in to advise, and the assembly was to wait. Before he could arrive, however, the agents were discovered by the islanders, and the agents conducting the survey were captured. Evidently, a witch from the elephant folk named Skiru managed to use her magic to communicate with the captured witch of the assembly, and they were able to explain themselves to one another. By the time the consultant reached the assembly vessel, the witches of both parties had come to an understanding. As the islanders only used speech as a tiny portion of their language, and the approximate word haru means far more than just their people, Skiru expressed indifference as to the term used to describe her people. So the assembly tends to defer to manifont, a term in older treatises, which is the archaic English for person and elephant. Out of concern for disease, the contact was minimal, but Skiru consented to a brief study and a series of interviews in exchange for information, metals, and luxury goods. The tribe on the island in question is made up of seven matrilines, or clans, several of which descended from the matriarch witch Skiru, although some were migrants and integrated in. Between the seven clans, the island supported a population of over a thousand. According to Skiru and her historians, this made them on the lower end of average for a tribe within the archipelago. Several dozen islands were accounted for in the original survey, some of which were significantly larger than their island, which was an estimated 4 by 9 miles. Skiru did not feel at liberty to estimate the total number of her people, but when asked if there was concern for their numbers, there are enough of her people that she found the notion ridiculous. Assuming the entire archipelago is populated, along with the other islands far beyond that she claimed, there is thought to be anywhere between 40 and 100,000 individuals. Though their range is restricted, their population appears quite stable. With the tallest individuals barely surpassing a meter at the shoulder, the Manifont is the smallest of all Probosidians in Kynir. They do not demonstrate the degree of sexual dimorphism either, although Merals, or Weirfonts, are generally a bit taller and have longer tusks, though Weefonts usually have tusks as well. Much like their giant mainland Gomphothier ancestors, they have four tusks. Manifont typically weigh between 120 and 250 pounds. Hair color on the island is mostly yellow and reddish brown, but some are gray, black, and white. Despite their small stature, kinder fonts take around 15 years to reach maturity, typical of mainland proboscideans. This prolonged childhood gives their high intelligence plenty of time to mature. Unlike the build of more insular dwarf proboscideans, their traits have more in common with neoteny, and overall look quite like juvenile elephants. The language of the Manifont is quite sophisticated, and vocalization is only a minor component. Although unable to produce many of the infrasonic sounds that their mainland cousins employ, they do use a range of sound to form the basis of an auditory component of their language. Their sense of smell is impeccable and used to interpret basic emotional experiences by other Manifont around them. For example, Skiru explained that to say, I am hungry, is considered childish, as of course everyone around you can smell your hunger. They are also an important visual component to their language, with the position of the ears and trunk often adding subtle nuance that can wildly change the meaning or context of a statement. At their core, however, most communication is done through scent, and the vocalization or visual cues are mostly to add nuance, politeness, accommodation for any members who might be disabled, or general clarification. Thanks to flexible lips and the tip of their trunk as an added adjustment, 
Many are often able to mimic enough human language to convey basic words and phrases, although it can be quite difficult and a challenge to accomplish for them given the expression and trunk position in their own language. They do have scent-impaired members, so the concept of communicating vocally or visually doesn't confuse them, although our statements of such things can clearly smell does contribute to a general sense of the language of people is riddled with somewhat childish redundancies. In the time of their meeting with the Manifant, many grasped the basics of English enough to express simple sentiments, and a few individuals are currently fluent. They were observed to have a wide variety of tools. Their agriculture is accomplished through a range of implements, most notably a plow that they push and pull with their jaws. Despite many neotenic features of the skull, their trunk is quite strong and adept, and their craftsmanship often shows great precision. Menifont wear rudimentary clothing, especially during the colder months. It is primarily made of staple fiber textiles that they weave in loom-like contraptions. The tools and clothing are all purely functional in terms of aesthetic, and they do not usually utilize dyes. At first this was assumed to be either a result of color blindness and poor vision, or perhaps an indication of cultural humility. However, discussion with Skiru quickly proved these ideas false. While Manifont are color deficient, having trouble telling the difference between green and red, their vision is quite keen, aided by more forward-facing eyes than most proboscideans. However, their vision is nothing compared to their sense of smell. While their clothing and tools may look only baseline functional, the sophistication with which they blend complementary or conflicting scents on their bodies, clothing, and adornments is of far greater importance. Many of these are more subtle than the human nose can detect, even indetectable completely. Skiru, for example, took great pride in the blend of aromas she cultivated in her robes, something the assembly observers had little to remark upon. Auditory decorations are often a symbol of status. While an anklet of shells might seem to be there for visual appeal, it is more for the sound that it makes that they walk that they appeal to the manifold. One of Skidoo's daughters made it clear that the auditory and olfactory senses are where beauty lies. The notion of physical attractiveness was a notion she and others found quite unrelatable. Although they are quite a pacifist people amongst one another, there is a long history of danger, and the Manifont have a dynamic organization of defense-focused warriors. The preferred weaponry is called a barugru, the same word for a warrior. It is a helmet which serves as a shield, which some have noted is reminiscent to a ceratopsian shield. It secures to their tusks, which are capped by sheaths of wood with shell, obsidian, or stone tips and blades. At the height of their trade with the Kentarim, they received many metal tusk caps, and many have found a range of ores throughout their island chain and mastered sufficient smithing that in many modern times as much as a third of Barugru caps are metal. The great frills are usually leather from some sea creature stretched over a wooden frame, so are more for visual intimidation rather than direct defense, although the frame can parry attacks from above quite well. Some will have bright patterns drawn upon them. While Manifont do not themselves put much stock in visuals, the dangers that they have faced include Megaraptorans and people, both of which have highly visual creatures and the Manifont have learned to intimidate accordingly. The Calorim, or Merfolk, have many of their own clans in the area. Many were spotted by the Assembly during their expedition, although they were not engaged. Skiru was unwilling to comment on the nature of their relationship with one another. Skiru also made a number of comments which implied that they were migrants from this distant island rather than indigenous. When asked to clarify, she said voyaging from another island closer to the mainland and tropics was one of their origin myths, although other Manifont claimed to be native, so she did not quite know. This origin on an island much closer to the mainland and toward the tropics does offer an explanation which puzzled many assembly scholars, 
which is how a mainland population swam all the way out to these islands through deep water, and also why they need to wear clothes in the colder months. Proboscideans are highly proficient swimmers, with earth tacks are recorded to swim a maximum of almost 50 kilometers, or 30 miles, so reaching an island closer to the mainland that would still serve as a sanctuary of sorts would be a sensible evolutionary place of origin. If they were already seafaring peoples by the time they came to their current residence, their presence is no longer a conundrum. Unlike all other known proboscideans, the Manifont are omnivores. Most of their diet is grass that they graze on the island, but a variety of kelp, seagrass, and processed seafood round out their meals. There is also a species of highly nutritious mushroom that they cultivate. It is not indigenous to the area, further supporting the notion that Manifont are from another region. Being proficient swimmers, they readily comb the shallows and interior of the barrier reefs. They avoid open waters due to numerous predators such as mosasaurs and sharks, but as much as half of their food comes from the abundant coastlines. As the waters surrounding their island are quite deep, shallow water monsters are quite rare. It is assumed the merfolk may aid in keeping the water clear of such threats. Skiru claimed that there were once great seals with long claws that could crawl on land, but heroes from the past called them to make the island safe. Aside from the occasional banshee gull or some other stray pterosaur, there are no regular threats to the Manifont. This was not always the case. They have legends of monsters and great insects abducting their people back to their original islands, slaughtering any who try to defend the Taken. The Assembly believe they are legends of the first children. Although Chimerans have myths of first children abductions, these are much easier to explain considering their prolonged lifespan. As one assembly agent remarked with grim amusement, an elephant never forgets. They also encountered Chimerans. Back during the Age of Witches, there were periods of peace and trade, but they were also invaded. The scars of this past, coupled with harvest by the first children, have left them highly suspicious of outsiders. Kentrim continued to trade with them throughout the Dark Ages and Mercantile Age, but maintained the secrecy of their location throughout. When their own island was captured by the Kajareth, many of their witches and elders carried the secrets of the Kurikurim along with the Merfolk to their watery graves. Many details of the Korikoim are shrouded in mystery, and out of respect for their well-being and agreed-upon treaties, it is likely that many aspects of their society will remain classified. Several Manifont have, since contact, joined the Assembly to provide further insight and clarity, not to mention satisfying their own curiosity about the wider world, although they have thus far honored many of the secrets that their ancestors keep. Thank you so much to Ian for sponsoring this episode. It was a delight from start to finish. I'm a member of the Syracuse Zoo and used study for this episode as an excuse to go check out their rare elephant twins a few times now. Definitely hoping to visit a few times in the summer too. Elephants are marvelous animals. My late grandmother, Dr. Strong, had a deep love for elephants that she imparted upon me. One of my earliest memories is of her and me staying at the elephant enclosure at the Syracuse Zoo, just watching them while my family toured the rest of the zoo. She always comes to mind when I'm working on elephants, and it was very special to work on them throughout May. I've started a story with one of the Manifont as a protagonist. Not sure if I will have it done by the next anthology, as there's so much to do and so little time, but I am optimistic that this episode certainly made me want to explore the idea further. Later on this month, we will learn more about the Manifont and other non-human Sophont species in the episode called Convergent Minds. Examining different ways intelligence has evolved and is expressed is a topic that has always fascinated me, and I'm very much looking forward to unpacking all that. 
Thank you so much to my Patreon patrons and YouTube membership subscribers. I am able to do what I do because of your support. Thank you for watching. Avid revenue goes a long way in keeping this channel moving, and watching, sharing, and commenting all help YouTube put my project out there. As the project continues to grow, I want to reiterate my appreciation for the support you all have given me. Thanks again to Ian for sponsoring this series, and thank you for watching. This has been so special to me, and I'm really thankful for the opportunity. Stay fantastic, everyone. Cheers, folks!